Welcome back, everybody. It's time once again for another episode of Health Talks. Dr. Trin, the one show, the only show that maybe shows you the way to a happier, healthier future. Looking at all the different aspects of health today, mental health, physical health, emotional health. The man who's usually healthy and up and with here, but this morning, Dr. Trin, where he's a no show this morning here, so we're doing it without him. Well, hopefully, he'll join us in a few moments. And uh, while we are, let's uh, bring in our guest. Um, I'm going to let him pronounce his name so I don't mispronounce it, but he's a doctor who's written a fascinating book. Welcome, doctor. Give us your name and your background. Thank you, Paul. My name is Barak Bharadwaj. I'm a hospice and palliative medicine physician. Hospice, and what was the other part of it? A hospice and something physician? Palliative, palliative oh, palliative. Medicine. That, we're going to talk a lot about palliative. That's a word that, an old Greek word to make you, what is it? Sort of means to to take comfort and care and, uh, uh, and concern. Uh, what yeah, is, I think the technical meaning is to cover. Uh-huh. Uh, it basically means you, you provide, you know, relief from suffering. Yes. In, in technical, uh, in medical terms, yeah. Yes. All right. Well, palliative care and um, hospice. My late great mother, uh, late in her life, got some bug that she was going to work in a hospice. This was back in Michigan. There aren't a lot of standalone hospices. I don't know if they're in every state around the country here, but more and more. So she took training and she went and she was a volunteer at hospices, helping the dead and dying. Mother Teresa, working with them at the last moment here, just to be there, to hold their hand, because nobody should die alone. Uh, talk about your work in hospice, and where do you do it? So I uh, I'm, I trained in internal medicine, geriatrics, and I had the pleasure of getting trained in an institution called San Diego Hospice in San Diego, 2004-2005. Since then, I had multiple jobs. Um, uh, basically uh, providing uh, in various roles. Uh, I used to lead a hospice at one point in time. And then uh, I sort of uh, was always uh, focused on providing uh, this these kind of services earlier to patients and moved into the realm of palliative care. Initially, I was working for a big hospital. Then I was overseeing uh, palliative care for a huge healthcare system, uh, which is what I'm doing in my current role as well. So let's break those down a little bit. Now, I know you wrote a book and we're going to get into that here, but I just, I think this is a fascinating world, maybe because my mother was involved in it, but I don't know that most Americans, if I stop people, if I went outside the building here and asked most Americans, what is palliative care and what is even hospice, that they would have much of a real understanding. Uh, so I'll start with what I understand, and you fill in the blanks. Uh, sure. Hospice is that end-of-life care. When somebody has made a determination, I guess a physician, that you are in a terminal stage of your life, there is no nothing else you can do. So they stop treating you. Uh, in fact, I think if you move into hospice, I remember when my aunt passed away a couple of years ago and moved into a hospice program. At that moment, the doctors couldn't see her or wouldn't see her. Medicare isn't going to compensate you anymore but a new team steps in to kind of just comfort and assist you and help you. There's other, some, a Medicare will pay for, I don't know, breathing machine or other sorts of devices, whatever you need at that last stage in life, but they stop treating you. Is that correct? Is that the definition of hospice when, when end of life is imminent or, or there's nothing else to be done? I think you have it mostly down a few things, if I might add. Yeah, please. Uh, Typically, it's for patients who have a prognosis or expected lifespan of six months or less. Okay. And along with that, you know, you, you know, in our field, we never, uh, we, we never like to say we stop treating. Right. It's just that the focus of treatment changes. Hmm. So while, say, for example, if a patient had cancer uh, and was being treated by chemotherapy or other modalities, typically those things would stop uh, for patients. But then, you know, there's a huge, huge uh, focus on making sure the patient is treated to may, uh, to alleviate the physical symptoms. And typically in hospice, it's a, it's a team effort, not just for, uh, from the point of view of making the patient physically comfortable, but also addressing their 
uh, psychosocial and emotional and spiritual needs. Right. And uh, it's a great support, not only for the patients, uh, but also their families. Now, I do want to mention that patients can live longer than six months on hospice as long as they qualify. Right. Uh, I don't want to get too technical, but you know, there are some hospices that will actually even provide what is typically considered aggressive care. Uh, you know, when you look at the concept of hospice, you know, where I trained, uh, we were taking care of patients on ventilators. We were taking care of patients who were actually still getting some form of chemotherapy, not to cure, but to palliate. Right. To, to, yeah. to alleviate the suffering. Exactly. Um, and so you've, at some point in time, this is a difficult decision for the physicians and for, and it's not just made by them. It's in consultants with the patient and the family and everybody here. We can't do anything more. This is it. We've done everything we can. So rather than just have you go home, we're going to now kick in a new team to support you. Maybe we will give you different drugs to help compensate for the pain, or we'll come up with other spiritual teams and uh, you know really this is it so what do you need to ride out this last phase in life are there actual hot in in michigan where my mother did this there were actually and i don't know if they were funded by the state or the county or, or private individuals but there were actually hospice facilities that you could move into because not everybody you can't do this in a hospital uh, the hospital won't let you sit there and die uh, you can't, you typically do this at home, but that's not always convenient or what everybody wants. Usually you want to be home. Um, but are there hospice facilities that you can do? And if so, how, how and where, and how does that all work? Yeah. So there are very few inpatient hospice facilities that are freestanding, mm -hmm. uh, across the country. So, uh, I think they're more so on the East Coast that I'm aware of. Michigan, they in had our, a bunch of them. I don't know why Michigan, but uh, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think in, in our region right here, we, we probably don't have uh, one. And I thought um, that's a shame because not everybody has a home to go home to. You're alone. What she found, obviously the people in this facility, they had nobody. Yeah. A, a shocking number of people have nobody at the end. Everybody they've known has, they didn't have a family or their family has died or they're d estranged from their family or what for whatever reason, but there's an awful lot of seniors hold up alone who are going to die alone. Talk about that. That's, a, that's an awful thought. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, having said that, there are hospices that figure out ways how to provide that level of care to patients. Uh, I have actually at times seen hospices uh, raise funds to provide room and board boarding to patients. Uh, and typically, you know, hospice is usually provided at home. So if patients find their way into a nursing home or assisted living, uh, you know, hospice is able to come and provide them the care there. Uh, most Americans would like to die at home, you know, as basically is what we learned uh, when uh, studies were held and surveys were conducted. So the whole focus is to be able to provide that level of care and support to patients and their families at home. Uh, I, I will just uh, stress upon the fact that it's not just the patient, right? It's all the family that, uh, it's also the family that needs to be cared for because they have the, I would say use the term burden because that's what I've heard the most. It is, uh, a, it is to, a burden. You don't want to think yeah. of it as a burden. I'll just, I've gone through this three times, my mom, my dad, and myself, I mean myself, my aunt, not myself yet, thank goodness. Um, and I'm an only child, so in each case, the burden fell to me. And I didn't want to think of it as a burden. I'm there for them. It's all about them. You're dying. I'm not. But right. it is a loss to grieve with. It is a reality to come to grips with. And it's a lot of intense stuff. The world, time seems to be suspended. You know, days turn in, uh, hours turn into, it seems like forever as you wait for things to happen. And, and the intensity of it, uh, the preciousness of it, maybe moment by moment as you realize this, this is it, uh, days, yeah. weeks, months. Uh, you, you don't sort of just casually go about and say, oh, I'll go stop seeing mom. Oh, maybe I'll see her next week. No, mom's only got a week. So you're there morning, noon, and night. Uh, and they want you there morning, noon, and night. because You never know when any of this is going to happen. Talk about that. It's an intense experience. You're absolutely right. And that's why I use the word burden because it prevents you from being the family member mm. to the patient because you get so caught up 
So I've met children that, you know, they were losing their parent and it's like, I just, and when they look back, they're like, I was so involved in caring for my father or my mother. Getting them water, wiping their head, uh, yeah. holding their hand, uh, making sure everything happens. You, you, be, you go into this, it's like a crisis mode. It is a crisis. Right. And exactly. so everything gets suspended and you drop your job, you drop everything and you, you know, whatever you, not everybody can do that, but to the extent that you can, it becomes your full-time focus until it's over. Absolutely. And it, it, it sort of deprives the family members or the caregivers, the ability to, you know, make that connection with the patient uh, before they transition is the word I like to use. Uh, and uh, because they don't have the support. So that's where hospice is really helpful uh, for patients and their families. All right. And now one more word, and then we'll get into your book here. So the other word that you throw out is a new fashionable word. We've done a few shows on it here at the station, but not many, because I don't think it's as mainstream as hospices. I think just about everywhere in the county, there's some, or the country, there's some sort of hospice program, maybe not in rural areas because they don't have the same staff abilities. But I, I think that pretty much everywhere in the country, there is something to turn to at the final moment, and this is what usually funded by the county or the state. I don't think it's fed, I don't think it's Medicare funded. Maybe it is. Who who puts this network of teams together? Uh, hospitals, uh, private partnerships, uh, public entities. Who, who pays for all this? Yeah, so it, it you know it all boils down to the insurance. So Medicare actually has a great hospice benefit. Um, <clears throat> people, when I met with colleagues from other parts of the world. They say that this is something to be envious of. Of course, here it's. I, I feel at times it's not enough for the patients and yeah. their families. Having said that, for the most part, most insurance companies will uh, replicate what Medicare uh, offers to their patients. And what is it that they are? give us a quick summary of what it is they offer? And then we'll talk about palliative care and how that differs. And then we'll get into your book and the stories that you've seen from the from the frontier, from the edge here. So what yeah, is so, it, what services are offered as a part of this? Program. For as part of hospice, uh, you know, basically you get you get a team, and it covers all the expenses related to the patient's uh, end of life diagnosis, right? Um, so it covers all the medications, the equipment that are delivered to the house. Uh, there is a team that comprises of a leading physician. You have nurses who visit the patient's home. Um, you have a social worker. You have a chaplain. Uh, other resources that need be. Uh, and uh, the good thing about hospice is if they are not able to provide something to the patient, they're always able to connect the patients and their families to the right resources that would get them access to what they need. Now, the other main uh, service that is often uh, overlooked is that hospice provides bereavement services to patients and uh, sorry, to the family members. So once the patient is gone, uh, the uh, family members can benefit from the bereavement services long after the patient is has departed. So it's one of these unique uh, services that, you know, is covered not only for the patients when they're alive, but it also is offered to the patient's family members when the patient is gone. Because that's important. You've now taken on this journey. You jump in there and you get as invested as you can and you're willing to, and you're there morning, noon, and night till it's over months on end. Um, uh, so I think that uh, what happens is when it's over, there's this huge letdown. There's this now what uh, moment. Uh, as you can imagine, there's a crisis and suddenly the crisis passes and they've left you and you're left yeah. with all those feelings and you're left with this hole. Hole, exactly. Yeah. So I think that uh, it's a spectacular program um, I'm going to talk about in a little more uh, in depth, uh, this end of life stage as I witnessed it, but let's talk about then this uh, newer concept of palliative care, borrowing this old forgotten Greek word, uh, uh to, uh, to, as you said, get to this earlier. It, do we just, I'm fighting, fighting, I'm taking cancer drugs. I'm taking all this stuff. I'm doing everything I can. And then suddenly you say, I quit. Or the doctor says, come on, this isn't working anymore. Uh, I just, I can't even give you this. Uh, some, then there's this radical transformation from fighting 
to uh, dealing with it, to, to making it as, as good as we can do then? What do we need to do once we come to this joint resolution that this is not going to, and that isn't to say that you have to do this. You can keep fighting to the very end. Um, I don't know if anybody pulls ma out of uh, hospice magically. Oh, they didn't die. There must be some. Uh, but I think there is a phase earlier than that where you're struggling. It, it, you, It's probably leading there, but you're not there yet. That's sort of palliative care, right? Right, right. And if, if I could just add a few things. You know, yes, there are times when patients uh, graduate from hospice. Yeah. They get better. And there are often times when uh, patients live a lot longer than expected. You know, there is something to be said uh, when patients are able to be comfortable. And, uh, you know, it, in my experience, that extends their, their lives. And uh, there are studies coming out now that, that are showing that, you know, if you manage certain aspects of the patient's being, mm -hmm. uh, not just focus on the disease, you actually are able to extend their life. So just by feeling better and not panicking and not and having some comfort yes. can give you a certain extension to your life. Just the mere fact you still got cancer or you still got a heart right. problem, but you don't panic and fear and you come to accept and deal with this and have support that in itself doesn't just make you feel better. It might actually make you live longer. Exactly. And then you, you brought up a very interesting concept. You said, you know, you're in this one mode where you're fighting, 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 and then you've switched to this other mode where, you know, now you're accepting what your right. eventuality is. And I think that's where palliative care comes in. It's, it's, it doesn't have to be either or, you know, you, you, you can be pursuing cure and you can be ensuring that the patients are comfortable. So that has been a big focus of my career. I've been very lucky. Uh, I took care of heart transplant patients before they got a heart transplant. Uh, I took care of bone marrow transplant patients while they were going through curative treatments because I believe that we need to get away from this uh, thought process of, well, if patients are pursuing cure, then they cannot be kept comfortable. Yes, right. Why is that? Be, that's really it. So, I, you know, I know this is you're in chemo and you're losing your hair and you're weak and everything else. But just go through it because we're bombarding this thing. We're trying to kill it. You're you're struggling to breathe. Your heart is failing you. But fight, fight, fight. And then all of a sudden they say, don't fight anymore. Or either right. you do or they do or both of you do. This is it. And this, so there's this dramatic shift quickly. I'll give you a perfect example of this, a, a really bad example of this. So my aunt, my mother's, uh, these, these people have all since died, but my late uh, mother had a sister who never married. So when my mother and dad, she moved out to be with them, not knowing that they'd precede her in death. And so uh, I was on Palm Springs. And so I suddenly got to take care of her. And, uh, and I willingly did so. She was a great lady. But I got to go through this three times instead of two times. And uh, so she had a very rare form of cancer called Waldenstrom's. Uh, it was a blood cancer disease, one of these orphan diseases. There's not enough people have it, so there's no, not much drugs or research. And they would give her this Procrit shot to artificially force her blood to make red blood cells. Horrible thing, hard on the body, can't do it forever, works less and less over time. And finally, one day, now she went to some cancer specialist doctor who was great, kept her alive. She was only supposed to live five years. She lived 20 years. So she exceeded everybody's expectation. In fact, she outlived original doctor who gave her the diagnosis. He died before she did. Uh, so all of these things happened. Now here's the bad news. So she came, she was a fighter. She was never given up, never given in. I've made it this long. I'll make it another 20 years, even though she's 90 or whatever. She just kept going, going, going. One day she called up to the doctor to get her weekly, monthly shot. And the nurse, the nurse said, you don't need to come anymore. What do you mean? Am I cured? No, doctor says not doing any good anymore. Thanks. See ya. And with that, she was told it's over. The doctor didn't come on. There was no, he treated her for years. He didn't take her aside and say, okay, no, this is hard to accept. And I wish I could give you some other hope and whatever. Nothing, no goodbye, no send off. Just, oh, uh, her, yeah, don't send her anymore. I just got the test results. This isn't working. She, she's, she's done. Uh, and she went home and wept 
and she was so shook up after years of training herself to fight, to, uh, to fight the fight that no one said would last this long. She was in fighter mode and instantly she was supposed to switch, throw the switch and go to, okay, I guess it's over. Uh, it was very psychologically hard for her. Um, and I think it did. I can't prove it because I know she was dying at that point, but I think it accelerated the whole thing and it didn't make those last six months good. She just lost all hope overnight. It cratered. She quit eating. She did everything. The doctor, God just told me I'm dead. Yeah. Well, Paul, uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for being there for your hand. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, having gone through this experience twice, you, you stepped in to yeah, help her out time, for the yeah. third time. Yeah. Yeah. So that's not easy. Uh, yeah. And you know, the thing is we as physicians, uh, I mean, I don't know the details as to why happened things a certain way, but we were never trained to deal with these kind of situations. No. Right. So that's why I went into this field is what I noticed was we were, we were, uh, you know, if you look at uh, medicine, I mean, we are living in some very uh, innovative times where patients are getting treatments that are unheard of. Right. Yeah. And so, uh, with un unbelievable results, she she was told exactly. originally this that ninety percent die within five years. You got a ninety percent chance this isn't going to last. She lived for twenty. That's why she moved out to be with my mom and dad. She spent the last couple of years with her sister, her only sister, and instead they died. Her doctor died, and she kept living. So it was a right. miracle in that sense. She got fifteen more years than they originally thought. Uh, but absolutely, I, I go to the the underlying thing. And that's why I bring it up. I, I'm not trying to bash medicine, but I will a little bit because. Their whole job is to protect, to preserve, to fight. And when they can't, I don't know that they know what to do. I don't know if it's an embarrassment or sort of it feels like a defeat for them or if it's just awkward or if it's they don't get paid anymore. or I, it's, a, it's a weird combination, but death is not dealt with well by most physicians. Yeah, I, I think it's not dealt well by, the, by our society in general. I agree to that too, yeah. Right. So I think uh, which one is feeding what? That's a different debate. Uh, but uh, I, I, at the end of the day, you know, I think the science acts has accelerated a lot faster than the sort of, uh, you know, the, uh, the cultural public, ability to catch up. Yeah. Right. The cultural ability to catch up. And then the other things that have come along with the science. Right. So, uh, so I grew up uh, not in the U.S. Mm -hmm. I trained in India, and you know I remember. I when thought that we was an to... Irish name. I'm sorry. I thought, I thought, <laughs> I thought, I thought it was an Irish name. I'm, I'm an Irishman. Yeah. I mistook you for another Irishman here. Yeah. So, uh, but you know, our goal when we were training was to extend life no matter what. Yeah. And then I came here, and I my first rotation was in a nursing home, and you know, culturally it was a little bit of a shock. Right. But then I saw all these people in the nineties who, you know, living to your nineties was unheard of, uh, as, uh, you know, 200, 300 years ago, uh, 50 years uh, ago, 20 yeah. years ago. Yeah. Right. So, so these patients are living longer, but when I, you know, interacted with them, most of them were not happy. No. And then the question came to my mind is what are we really doing? You know, is it, you know, are we, we prolonging just, life just because we can, or are we giving them some sort of quality existence quality, here and exactly. extra time and extra memories and extra life? Yeah, boy, that's a that's a rough one there because I, right. you know, it's it's the living uh, will idea, um, whatever they call it. The I forget the you know the term that the, every hospital makes you fill out. Kind of what do you want us to do in the case that you're. Um, uh, have a heart advanced attack. directive advanced yeah. directive yes where they do we want me to keep you alive at all costs do you want to be a vegetable do you want to do a no 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 well then okay then we're not going to do certain things well i don't know about that you know and you, you wrestle with this back and forth uh at, at what point do you quit and at what point are you sustaining life to nobody's benefit not theirs that was my original mother's situation she had parkinson's she had all sorts of other than dementia that set in. And I'll tell you at the end, it was a relief to her and me and all of us when she finally passed away. My poor dad wouldn't say this out loud because he loved her so desperately. 
and needed her and wanted her, but she had left sometime earlier and we were just keeping the body alive. Yeah, and I think that's very difficult for patients and their family, uh, sorry, the family members to witness, you know. Uh, you, you Actually, that's one of the first things I heard when I started training in that nursing home, exactly what you said, that the person is gone and the shell is left. Yeah. And they said, please don't, please don't continue. And it was such a revolutionary idea for me. It's like, what do you mean? Why wouldn't you want? And then I, you know, the more I started spending time with these patients, I learned that, you know, there are limits to what we can do and there are limits to what patients want to go through. There are limits to what we should do. All right. So we've talked right. enough about the situation. Let's talk into the book. You wrote this book and what's the name of the book? The name of the book is Stories from the Edge of Life. Stories from the Edge of Life. What a fascinating concept. Um, what did you, why did you write this book, first of all? And then we'll yes. talk about what some of these stories. Why, why did you, were you moved to share these stories? So, you know, I, as, as you were aware, it's a unique job that I have, right? Uh, taking care of patients. A uh, job who, most of us would yes. never do in a hundred million years because 100% of your patients are not going yeah. to make it. Your mother yeah. Teresa dealing with people and then they'd say to mother Teresa, I'm a good Irish Catholic. They'd say, why are you doing this? There's absolutely no chance. These, you, you, you know, these are all going to die. And she said, but they should die with dignity. Right. You're right. I think dignity is the key word there. You, you, and you're right. You know, I, 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 we, when I was training, I was running away from these kind of situations with patients Every and so doctor my colleagues. Does. And I was like, you know, well, you know, if we went into medicine to help people, these are exactly the people who need our help more than anybody else. Right. Right. And that's what drew me into the field. Uh, but then, you know, it's not all, uh, gloomy you know palliative care has been very re rewarding uh, i take care of patients who get cured and who you know live their lives in you know, 10 15 20 years uh, but coming back to your question about why i wrote this book so uh, i used to come home and once in a while i would tell my wife about things that have happened at that had happened at work right uh, of course i always respected the patient's privacy never told them who they were sure. right. uh, and uh, she would always tell me why don't you write a book you know, this could help patients and their yes. families and, you know, just, she found them to be fascinating. And, um, I just never had the time. And then the, cause pandemic, there's another one and another one and yeah, another one and exactly. another one. Yeah. It doesn't end. Right. Yeah. Right. And so the pandemic hit us and I was able to cut some of my commute time from my day. Oh, there you go. And I was like, like okay, so what do I do with this time? I, I got to make the best use of this time. What is it that I haven't been able to do? And uh, I said, hey, I need to write this book for two reasons. You know, one is it was a pending project. Mm -hmm. And two, I, in a way, I, I just want to leave a legacy for my kids as there well. There you go. There um, you go. Don't we all want to do that? We had a woman on Dr. Trin's show who was a different kind of story, but she's an opinion writer for USA Today. And she wrote a book about her immigrant experience. She's Vietnamese. She was one of those people airlifted out at the last minute in Saigon, as was Dr. Trin. So they shared some of those stories and how they came and what it is. And we asked the same question, why? She said, because most of my kids don't really know this. And my grandkids right. certainly don't or won't. Somebody has to leave, tell this story, leave it behind. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, the stories will mean different, uh, will have a different meaning to different people at different times of their lives, you know? So the same, same story can have a different meaning. So I, I mean, my kids might have heard some of them from me. But I think uh, as they move along with their lives, uh, you know, they, it, it will have a different meaning. And, and my personal, uh, you know, takeaway from the various stories that are in this book. And also the other, the last reason for writing this book, most important is I, I founded a nonprofit uh, to help educate clinicians around the world about palliative care and its principles. It's called Palliative Care Network. So all the proceeds from this book go to that endeavor. Well, I should, uh, I, I should endeavor to correct my earlier thing. I, it was my mistake. Dr. Trent was never going to be here this morning. I did get an email from him. He's, I forgot all about this. I'm sorry. Uh, he's in Quantico, Virginia. His son is graduating uh, from a boot camp or was it boot camp or is uh, the next induction into the next level, but he's back in Virginia celebrating his, uh, with his son. So he sends his condolences. He's tuning in this morning. So I apologize for my, 
misstep this morning. I could do so many shows, I missed that one. Uh, but no, let's go back to... Congratulations to him and his son. Yeah, really. Well, that's a whole nother deal. I mean, Dr. Trin, one of the things he did, I think this is, we'll go down a rabbit hole for a second. Here he's an immigrant. He comes here, and like so many immigrants, he felt, thank you for America. I feel an obligation to serve. So he joined the Marines when he was 18. He didn't have to join the Marines. I never joined the Marines. I'm, uh, I'm a good American, but let somebody else do that. But so many immigrants, I think, are so moved by what they have in coming. I don't know if you felt that way, others, but he, he felt the need to serve. So now his kid grows up in affluent Orange County. He's a doctor. You know, this kid doesn't know Vietnam from a hole, a, a hole in the map here, whatever, I don't think. You know, there's no real, there Americanizes everybody else here and uh, video games and skateboards and everything. But he hears the story of Dr. Trin's struggle to get here and his family struggle to get here and his feeling, I got to give something back. And his son, much to his, I think, happiness, but, but shock after he graduates from UC Santa Barbara, it's not like he didn't have other options, says, I think I'm going to do what you did, Dad. I'm going to put a couple of years service in. I'm like, wow, okay. So there is a... Anybody who says immigrants are the problem ain't looking at the reality of it. Immigrants are what, what make this country great and keep it alive, in my opinion. But anyway, so much for my little political rant this morning here. No, but, I, I will, if I might just second that, uh, America is a great country. I'm an immigrant myself. Uh, I came to this country to practice the best medicine possible. And that's what drew me to hospice and palliative care because I think that allows us to bring back that human and humane element. Uh, back to medicine. That is missing out of, out of uh, what should we call it, assembly line medicine. Next, you got five minutes. Next, you know, it's all I can do. Time's up. Next, uh, there is an assembly line that we've turned so much of medicine into. And I know we do it to save costs and et cetera, et cetera. But we, at the cost, the real cost of it is that human connection. I don't have any human right. connection with the doctor anymore. I just go to a clinic and somebody sees me and I'm in there for five minutes and I get my pill or I get my diagnosis and somebody else comes in. There isn't an yeah. ongoing level of concern, care, connection too many times anymore here, I'm sorry to say. so that's Well, I think, uh, you know, as a society, what, what I've noticed is we, we, things become a priority when we go to through them as a personal experience. So, you know, yes. Oh, wow. end of life is end of life is one of those things. Nobody wants to talk about. Nobody wants to think about, but when you're there, you're like, I, I just had a friend the other day. He's like, what support do we have? We've just been we're feeling lost for the last six months. You nailed it right there. I yeah. don't want to, I'm a good baby boomer. I'm never, I'm still dressed like I'm in college. I'm still wearing my college uh, sweatshirt here and my cap from UCI. You know, I haven't, I, you think I'm still, 25 or 35 and I'm 65, but I can tell you from personal experience, I was not ready for it. I didn't want to hear about it. I didn't want to think about it. And each time I was thrust into this role, screaming, kicking and screaming. And I, I'll just give you a quick little evolution because we really got to get some of your stories in here too. Sure. So I'm, I'm sorry to sure, just tell my stories here. But uh, so my dad, my mother was the first one to pass away and we were actually pretty grateful it was over. But I couldn't be there when she died. I left the room, uh, made some excuse. I'm going to go lay down for a while. And she took that moment to die because I think she knew I couldn't stand to watch this happen. And my wife says, how that's horrible. You got to be there. Hold their hand as they're dying. I said, oh, how barbaric. I don't want to see this. I don't want to be there. I can't. So when my dad finally passes away a couple of years after that, I made an effort to be there. And it was a big difference. And finally, my aunt, by this time, I'm more comfortable with it. And so she's in a nursing home, nursing facility. And I race out. They tell me it's time's up. Uh, she's going to die within a couple hours. I get in her car. I race to Palm Desert. I'm there. And I get there like a half hour before she dies. And I'm holding. Now, she's in a coma all day. And uh, so I'm sitting there saying to myself, and she's very, this isn't a violent death. Some go through a violent, you know, gasping for air and stuff. She's just peacefully passing away. And it was so beautiful. I hate that. It's so weird to think, but it was almost like she could hear angel music and stuff. It was very beautiful. And I'm saying to the nurse, you know, my aunt is from the Midwest. She's a good lady, but I never heard her say the words, I love you. They just don't do that. That's, you don't have to say that. We don't say that kind of mushy stuff here. And I said, I wish one time I could just hear her say, I love you. And she hadn't talked all day. This is like out of a movie. 
And all of a sudden she starts mumbling and they go, oh my God, she's trying to say something. I'm going, yes, yes, what is it? What's your final words? What are you going to say? And she says, I love you. And with that, she dies. Wow. And I thought, oh yeah. my God, I get teared up. I had to wait my whole life at the final sex. She cut it pretty close there. Uh, but <laughs> but to be there at that moment, and, and now here's the shocker. So when I was there, the nurse looked up and he said, well, your mother must have really loved you. I said, this is my aunt. She said, your aunt? She said, why are you here? I said, because somebody's got to be here and I loved her. And she said, nobody comes. That's why we're here. You're in a nursing facility. We usually just phone it in. They're gone. People cry for five minutes and they go on with their life. Baby boomers, our modern society tells you it's awful. You don't want to be there when they die. And we don't bury them. We don't go through any big ceremonies anymore. They're just gone. What happened to Aunt Susie or my Aunt Florence? She's gone. We lost her. Where did she go? We can't even see the word dead. Uh, it, it, it is, I think it is the last taboo subject in a world where we can talk about anything and often do in great detail. We cannot face, talk about, or be at the point of death. What do you think of that? That's my personal takeaway, having been there three times. No, you, you, you absolutely right. I think if there's one reality that nobody can escape, yeah. it's death. Yeah. And that's the one thing, you know, it's guaranteed. And it's the one thing no we aren't prepared are. for. We don't want to talk right. about I tried to talk about it with my friends. They didn't want to be there. Nobody wanted to come to a funeral. They're barbaric. I hate funerals. I feel sorry for you, but life goes on. We are so in this Peter Pan generation. We're never going to get old. We're never going to die. And it's, we don't want to be negative. And everything's positive and happy talk. So when something inescapable like death faces us, we as a society don't know how to deal with it and don't yeah. deal with it very well. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the eventual mystery, right? It's, it's, uh, it's, it's the fear of facing the eventuality that nobody knows what, in my opinion, what happens after, right? And maybe because so, we've lost our religion, yeah. you know, there isn't anything to guide us. I still hold on to mine. So maybe that helped me believe this wasn't the end. Maybe it's a fairy tale, but I got to believe there's something else. <laughs> that goes yeah. on, but they're not completely gone. All right, so I've dominated too much of the conversation here. We've got 10, 15 minutes. Tell me some of the stories from the, uh, what's the name of the book again? Stories from the Edge of Life. Stories from the Edge of Life. All right, give yeah. us a couple stories from the Edge of Life here. Yeah, and, and before I do that, I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, go back to your story. <laughs> yeah, right? tell about, my story. About, uh, yeah, with, with your aunt. And that is, you know, uh, these are profound experiences which have profound impacts uh, which have a profound impact after the patient is gone. Okay. You know, like you were able to hear those three words from your aunt and you, we're still talking about it, right? Forever. And so, I'll forever remember it. It, it. it moved me. It was a, it turned out to be a beautiful experience. And I still shake my head and see people say, beautiful, she died. No, right. it was hard and it was awful, but there was some, there was a piece to it, a, a there was a, there was something about it that I'm glad I experienced it as awful as it was. Wouldn't want to do it all every day, but, but if you got to die, this is the way to do it. Right. And, uh, and that's what we try to do is ensure that the patients are comfortable enough yeah. that they can spend valuable time with their family members and the family members get to spend valuable time with them. If you got to die, this is the way to do it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, coming to my book, uh, uh, I'll start off with some of the stories that have made a profound impact on me personally. Okay. Um, one, uh, the first one actually, uh, first or second one in the book is, uh, is an experience I had when I was a resident. Okay. Uh, and I met with, I was asked to come and see this patient in the ICU. Uh, he was involved in a motor vehicle accident. He was in an 18 wheeler that had a head on collision with another one on the freeway and uh, uh, long story short, his wife was called and his wife lived in the other part of the earth. Uh, far and away. Was <laughs> far away, exactly the opposite side of our planet from where we live and was informed that, hey, we just, uh, we, we, are, we are calling you to convey our condolences. There's been this very bad accident, uh, no survivors. And uh, she was newly married. She'd just been married for three months. Wow. Husband had come to the U.S. And I mean, 
just pause for a moment and think if you were in her shoes and you got this kind of news. You know, everybody's tuning out and shaking their, we're all covering our ears. Yeah. No, 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 no. I don't want to hear this. I don't want to think about this. Yeah, right. Yeah. And she said, well, I appreciate you calling me, but I'll tell you what, there's only going to be one survivor of this accident and that's going to be my husband. She wouldn't accept it. If somebody's going to make, I'm telling you, they're not all dead. Okay. Yeah, she said, they're not all dead. Only one person is going to survive, and that's going to be my husband. And guess what? She's she was right. right. She knew. <laughs> yeah, she was right, and I actually had the privilege of meeting her. And she was a very unique person. She was able to, uh, you know, actually, when I first met her, I told her I don't think her, I was being gentle, you know, yeah. as a physician. I know, I know you want to believe this, but come on, lady. She, he's dead. Yeah, and he was, he was in such bad shape. Uh, when I met her for the first time, you know, she stood there with a grin on her face. Um, and I thought she didn't know what was going on. Yeah, right. And so I said, Hey, I don't want this to come as a shock. Oh, you're right. I she in denial. So I took her to the side. And I said, Hey, let me just tell you what's going on. She knew everything that was going on. And, uh, this, her husband was on life support, you know, a ventilator. And, uh, you know, rather than telling her that, look, I don't think he's going to make it. I told her, I don't think he's going to ever come off the ventilator. Yeah, right. And she said, he's going to be off it by tomorrow morning. You're like, and the, I was you're like, like, lady, I, I, <laughs> I know you want to believe, but come on, wake up. Come on. Yeah. Look, he's in a head end collision. This is, right. I've been doing this forever. This, you don't make it out of this. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and guess what? When I came into work next morning, and I went <laughs> into his room. He was off the ventilator. <laughs> and she, I don't know how she was able to every, like, we would say something to her and she would most of the time just say the opposite and say, you just wait for 12 hours and you'll see this happen. And it was just fascinating to me. I've never met a person like that, but she was, you know, she was able to sort of predict the future. 12 hours or so in advance. See, see, and this uh, untrained woman could see what the... The, the smart people in the room couldn't see her. Exactly. Exactly. So that was a very fascinating experience I had. I still actually keep in touch with that family. Uh, Do you ever, um, I, 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 this is going to really sound weird, but we had somebody come on the show a while ago who was a coroner. Uh -huh. And she wrote about how she sees like ghosts and stuff. And everybody says, I know. She said, I think you all think I'm crazy. But she said, I know a lot of coroners. We think when they die, they sort of hang around for a while or something. And she could say, I could sort of sense them in the room or hear them in the room or whatever. And I'm like, oh, come on, lady. This is, now you're getting way out there. But I don't know what that, you all are in the front. To, you are at that, if we believe there is something after, and I do. I don't know what it is. But we, I, I can't accept, I can't accept that this is all there is. Maybe that's just the fairy tale I've told myself. But having said that, have you had any experiences where somehow they do die and you still feel them or hear them or see them? Or, or am I just, I've never had that in my life. I, I don't know, but you're out at the frontier, not me. Not personally. I mean, I, 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 I I'm very objective <laughs> yeah, me too, right. because it's, it's, uh, you know, it's easy to get sucked into different things, but, uh, but I respect everything that I'm told by patients and their family. Do people so tell you, my I, wife, after her mother died, said yes, she came and talked yeah. to me. Or people will say, I woke up in the middle of the night and I was dreaming of my mother. And I, then somebody calls me and says, my mother, your mother just died. Why was I dreaming of my mother? Why she was talking to me in my dreams or something here? Like, and, and all these weird things. And you're like, ooh, this is the twilight zone. I don't know. You, I, It's hard to believe any <laughs> of this stuff here. But. Yeah, actually, yeah. The, you know, when you say Twilight Zone, you're right. I, I, I always like, I really believe truth is uh, stranger than fiction. I've seen it happen so many times. So yeah. like, like with your aunt, right? A lot of times family members and patients have said, uh, I'm waiting for X, Y, Z person. And I, and, and, you know, once that person comes, they make the transition. You know, maybe your aunt was waiting for you. My to, mother, to, to, yeah. I've heard that many times. My mother yeah. used to say that in her work, the story she always told is she went there one late at night, which my father hated. She'd go down to this thing down in the in, inner city. We lived out in the little upper class suburbs. She'd drive down and do her duty, her shift. 
and it was like, you know, there was a red light in those rooms that would go on. They would out, they would literally in this facility put a red light outside the room when they were actively dying in the, somebody's opinion. So be extra careful because this person hasn't long to live. So she came on shift. There's an, a red light. She goes in to talk to the person and she starts holding their hand and doing all the stuff she's trained to do. Let go. It's okay. Somebody's here and the person's saying, no, 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 I can't die. I'm not going to die yet. I'm waiting. I, I, I'm not, I, I, I need to hang on. And, and she's like, I know, I know, but just let go. It'll be okay. You know, trying to get them that she thought she's just afraid of die. This person's just afraid of dying. And it turns out they were waiting for somebody. And all through the night, this guy struggled and said, no lady, I'm not going yet. Can't, I'm, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting. And she's like, waiting for what? And finally, that morning, his son showed up, who he was estranged from, he hadn't seen in like 20 years. And he comes rushing in, and there's this tearful reunion. And then the dad died. Yeah, I've seen that happen many times. Uh, and and I, I recall one experience where I walked into a patient's room, and he was going through the dying process, and I... I I woke him up to ask him if he was doing okay. And he said, Hey, do you see her? Do you see her? Yeah. Uh, and I'm like, what are you talking about? I think there's an angel standing right there. And I said, you know, I, I better not get into <laughs> yeah, well, in, interfere, interfere with this process because I, I think it's, uh, there's something to be said, you know, the patients have experiences that I, I necessarily don't, you know, understand, but I respect, you know, what they go through. So uh, I, I think it's a very sacred time that patients go through, uh, you know, right before transition. So I try to leave them uh, alone as much as I can, as long as they're comfortable. So that's usually my, my approach. Is there a path to transition or is everyone unique? Or some must be difficult, some must be quick, some must be beautiful, some must be horrible to watch. Gas yeah, you're there. right. I think each one has its own unique journey. And, uh, you know, and you're right. Uh, closure before death, I think, is very important. You know, I've seen patients who have closure before they die with, you know, all the pending issues. not have closure. Off. Oh, my goodness. We've all have stories. Of that. I remember years ago, my, yeah. I had a boss, good Irishman that he was, and uh, he had a horrible relationship with his father. He flew back to see him, they had a horrible fight, and he left mad as usual. I know why I moved away. That old man, boom, 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 and comes out back to California. This is like in Maine, his father or something. And as soon as he lands, his father has a heart attack and dies. And he was yeah. so devastated. Oh, my God, this is how I left it after all these years? Yeah. This is how we left it? Yeah, so life is very fragile, right? So we got to be very careful interactions with our loved ones because you never know if you'll get a second chance with them or not so i've seen that happen as well and uh you know to answer your question a few other stories uh you know along the lines that you're talking about i had a i had one patient where you know we actually actually had to sedate him to ensure that he is not suffering through the pain young very young patient in his 20s really suffered a lot we had tried all medications you know they weren't working for him and actually the first time i met him he had asked me this is just unbearable. Can you please sedate me? And, yeah, right. You know, we, we, we had to make, make sure that we had tried everything. You know, that's sort of like a last option. Right. So we had, we sedated her and, um, uh, he was knocked out school, you know, like he was well sedated, he looked very comfortable. He had to be admitted to the hospital just for that reason. Um, and usually after a patient transition, I would call their loved one and I call this patient's mother, you know, after a few days. And she actually sounded the, so happy <laughs> and relieved because every time I'd seen her while her son was alive, she, you could just, you know, feel the, the tension that she was living uh, yeah. moment by moment. And when I, when I asked her how did things go and she said, you know, he was well sedated, but then uh, a day before he died, out of the blue, you know, as I was pacing his room, he he just sat up and he knew exactly where I was. He knew exactly where to look when he opened his eyes. And he looked at me and he said, mom, don't worry, everything is going to be okay. And then he just went back to sleep. Never spoke again. He, and he struggled that out of the, the yeah. heavy sedation you've given him. He exactly. shrugged it off. 
and came out because he had one last thing to say. Wow. Exactly. Wow. He never said a thing again, but those words were so comforting to the mother. Yeah. Well, um, oh, oh, my goodness, yes. Because yeah. you want to feel like you did the best. You, you, you know, For sometimes I think it's more for our sake than for theirs. You know, it's their last gift to us. Forgiveness, right. a word. My mother, my aunt saying, I love you. That didn't help her, but it was her. It, it showed she did love because it, it was, it must have been hard. She could hear this. That's the other thing that I struggle with. And I know we're out of time here, but I'll give you one last question here. Do these people in the end, in comas, in sedation, still hear us? That's what they always tell us that that's the last sense to go. They may not see us, smell us, be aware, but they can still hear. Is that anecdotal? Is that some truth? Do we know? I think, you you, uh, you know, we, we always assume that they can hear us, right? Because the as the patients are going through this process, you know, the, the body is getting weaker. So right. they might be able to hear us, but they don't have the ability to respond back. Right. Right? So... Uh, my aunt clearly heard me. They hadn't heard her exactly. talk all day. I didn't hear her talk. And as I'm, that's why I'm talking over her. I know she can't hear me. She's in a coma. And I'm just saying out loud my final wishes. And she right. hears that and responds in a way that shocked everybody right. in the room, me included. So she, like you were saying, she, she, she hadn't moved, but then she mustered the courage and the energy to say those words to you. Yeah. So yeah, we, we see that happen often. Wow. Well, I hope people often pick up this book. How do they get it? Where do they get it? And uh, oh, it's uh, it's on Amazon. Uh, you know, uh, give us the title again. Amazon. So every, if they haven't picked it up already, here it's what's the name? Stories of the book? from the edge of life. Stories from the edge of life. I I would love to see a copy and and get a copy. I'll have to buy one or whatever. I'm not trying to get a free one, but. It, it, I'm very moved by this subject, having experienced it a couple of times and started like most Americans. I don't want to be there. I don't want to hear about it. I don't want to handle it. It's awful. It's horrible. I just faster it's over for me, the better and for them. And somewhere along the way, I began to see this doesn't do, this isn't good. They're, they're, you're all there for the birth of a child and how excited you are. Why are few of us there for the death of a loved one? And why is it any, I know it's difficult, but in that difficulty, there are magic moments for all of us. Maybe it's a final word. Maybe it's a final forgiveness. Maybe it's a final thought. Maybe it's just knowing that you're there for them and holding their hand as they got to be scared uh, going through this. Whatever it is, it's an experience that we run from and we shouldn't. Absolutely. And I think the more we embrace it, the more we will appreciate life in general. Yeah. And uh, I actually had one patient who was on hospice and he told me he was having the time of his life <laughs> because now all, all his family members, all his friends that he hadn't met for years, they were all coming. And he said, every day is a party for me. Wow. And he was just so happy. So, you know, it's, it's the way we approach things that make a, a huge difference in, in life overall. Well, thank you for the work you do. We, we thank our veterans. Uh, you're a veteran from a different fight. Uh, and I thank you for being there on the front lines when few of us will, or what we've, we've somehow, particularly in Western society, I don't know if in India as much, but we have taken this whole transition, this whole palliative end of life process and outsourced it. We ship yeah. them somewhere. You handle it and call me when it's over. Thank you for taking right. care of them, but I don't want to, I'm not going to, and and I think that's wrong. I think the, the, there's got to be more involvement in everybody. I, I'm glad you're there. Not everybody has the opportunity to, to the ability we work. It's difficult. It's emotional. I get a thousand reasons why we run from that. That doesn't mean it's right. You know. We're, yeah, it, it is a reality that we can't run away from. And I think the more we, we are comfortable embracing it, the better off we will be as a society. For them and for us. Yes. All right. Thank you once again. I hope you will come back again because I don't feel like we gave you full. Uh, I'm sure you got a lot more stories than mine. I, you just moved me to tell all my stories as often happens on this show. You know, uh, actually, that's all. That, that's exactly what this book is all about because, you know, it's to draw the reader in to write their own story. So I've left enough space in the book that they can actually think about. And in the, the, the whole idea is to, to provoke the thoughts, you know, and their own feelings. As they read the book, yeah, as they read the book. Well, and then, it, you know, 
I'm yeah. a living example of it. I didn't mean, I, I said in the beginning, I want to hear your stories and, and uh, great stories. And here I'm, you provoke me telling all my stories again here about my experiences with this. And, and I think that is the cathartic value. There's another word you don't hear very more catharsis. Yeah. Uh, but the, the getting it out and getting it in the open, we don't do it. We had a show you for years on the station called The Grief Girl. I'm sorry to say she has since passed away, but she dealt with grief. She was a grief counselor. And she said, grief and particularly grief over dying are the last taboo topics. We can talk about anything. Everybody's coming forward with whatever, and we're all shocked. Oh my goodness, Bruce Jenner isn't a man. He always wanted to be a woman. And, you know, we transition and, and good. I'm glad this stuff comes out as uncomfortable and difficult as it is, but nobody talks about dying. Oh boy, I don't want to be there. I don't want to hear it. That's a taboo. Uh uh uh. I'm not going to talk about it. Positive, happy thoughts only. Yeah. Now, Paul, actually, I, I would like to thank you again for for the opportunity and also sharing your story. You know, because I think it's it's best better coming from you than from me because <laughs> I, you 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 live the experience I did. right of being a caregiver. Um, I'm not there yet. At some point, I will be. So I, I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, I. I Appreciate your time, and I'll be more than happy to come again. I'll Just talk to know. Dr. Chen when he's here, because I'd love to hear his perspective on this, too. Um, uh, and, and we should have you come back and spend more time on the stories. Uh, one more time, the name of the book is? Stories from the Edge of Life. Stories from the Edge of Life. Thank you so much for sharing those stories with us here this morning. Thank you. On and Health thanks Talks. to our veterans. Yep. Yeah, right. Exactly. So there you go, folks. Too much or not enough? I hope it provokes you to tell your own stories and think about your own health, including the health at the last moment of your life, for you and for them. Right here on Health Talks, where we talk about it all. Join us next week as Dr. Trin joins us. We have some more Health Talks right here in Orange County's only community radio station, OC Talk Radio.